Imagine a book that has sold millions of copies and is considered to be sacred scripture by countless people around the world. This book tells the story of our departure from God and ultimate reconciliation with him. It speaks of the importance of love and forgiveness, and its main teacher is Jesus. You might think I'm talking about the Bible, but I'm actually referring to A Course in Miracles. If you are new to the course, A Course in Miracles is a spiritual path where we find our way home to God by learning to distinguish between what is real and what is unreal. What is real is our true nature as God created us. We are holy, we are worthy, and we are equal to one another without exception. What is unreal is everything else, these bodies, our egos, and the judgments and the grievances that we hold. The course is leading us to a place where, through the practice of forgiveness, we learn to look beyond the unreality of physical form to the pure and eternal holiness in everyone. If we can do this, if we can train ourselves to see only the true nature of one another, then we will be spiritually advanced enough to heal all of our relationships, and in turn, we will heal our world. As students of the course, so many of us have held this message in our heart. We have shared it with one another. But what we have typically shied away from is sharing it with the world. And this is understandable because the course hasn't gained the kind of cultural awareness and acceptance needed for real conversations with people who are unfamiliar with it. And so there's a danger of being considered fringe or worse, heretical. And so rather than attempting to explain the course, which is not easy, or attempt to counter the misinformation about the course that is everywhere online, is it a cult and so on, many students just don't talk about it at all. But something happened recently that has made those of us here at the circle feel like it's finally time to go beyond the bounds of our current audience of course students and attempt to dialogue with Christians in particular about this path. And that is the twin movements of deconstruction and reconstruction within the Christian church. These days, countless Christians are rethinking their faith. And in the case of deconstruction, abandoning Christianity altogether, and in the case of reconstruction, rebuilding it from the inside out. As Robert and I have been watching the process of deconstruction and reconstruction play out from the sidelines, lately we found ourselves very inspired by a few voices that are in the wilderness, as I said, voices who are asking the very same questions that we asked ourselves before coming to the course. And this made us feel that the course has something meaningful to offer Christians who are re-examining previously held beliefs, and we wanted to open a dialogue. So over the next few months, we will be reaching out to Christian writers and thinkers who may be interested in having a conversation with us and learning more about the course. And today is the kickoff and the announcement of this focus for us and for the circle. Right now, it's just Robert and I, so it's not much of a dialogue yet, but we have to start somewhere, and our goal is to begin a series of discussions in the spirit of the late author, Rachel Held Evans, and adopt her model of not trying to burn anything to the ground, just opening an intelligent and loving conversation where everyone is invited. And we're beginning today with this topic of what does A Course in Miracles have to offer Christians who are leaving the church. That title is a little misleading, though. You don't have to be leaving the church to find value in this episode. You could be considering leaving, just asking questions, just curious about what the course is and how it connects with Christianity. We'll be covering all of those topics today, along with who we believe the course was written for what it teaches that is similar and different to Christianity, and if you decide to become a student of the course, what to tell your friends and family members who are concerned that you may have just lost your mind. Robert, you have been a student of the course for more than 40 years, but you grew up Christian, and so we thought it would be a good beginning to this discussion to 
talk briefly about our own background with Christianity and why we became core students. So go ahead and kick us off. Yeah, I uh, grew up Presbyterian. We switched to being Lutherans when I was in my teens. I got very into the youth group, was quite serious about it, and reached a point, I started doing a lot of thinking, and I realized I didn't know why I believed what I believed. And that propelled me on a search in which I ended up studying a lot of things and coming upon what I felt was evidence for a Christian, not no, for a spiritual worldview. And that, that process took me out of the church and into spirituality. But as I went into spirituality, I retained a focus on Jesus. And that whole search eventually led me to A Course in Miracles, where I have been ever since. So my story is that I grew up in the church. My parents divorced when I was two. I went with my dad. And even though I had the most amazing grandmother who lived right next door, the church was my mom. I was constantly going to church camp, lock-ins, vespers, drinking the grape juice. And the church and everyone there were such a home for me that a few years ago when I got a divorce uh, and I felt like my life was kind of spinning, I drove to the church that I attended as a kid and just sat in the parking lot because that's how much of a safe space that particular church felt to me. And I grew up Presbyterian too. As an adult, I became a Baptist and, and that's when the questions really started coming in is my best friend who is gay welcome here if i wanted to be the pastor of this church one day would i be allowed why is there zero diversity here and the final straw for me broke when i attended a service in charlotte north carolina where the congregation was asked to step forward to the stage to actually get out of your seat, go up to the stage together as a public commitment to protest an abortion clinic. And I got up, but I walked right out the door <laughs> and I haven't been back to church since. And I don't have this sense of like righteous indignation about church. Mostly I'm just sad because it meant so much to me growing up. As I said, church was like my mom. And I feel like we didn't part on good terms. Yeah. But you had really parted long before that. I mean, you were going back for your son. and But it was yeah. still, I mean, the, to hear your story of those different points, um, and of course, I know more detail about your story. It's like millions of stories out there. So many people are streaming out of the Christian church for reasons just like yours. Yeah. So right now there are obviously a million reasons why people are leaving the church. And Robert and I have been kind of bouncing them back and forth for a while now. But if we had to boil it down just in the interest of time, the, the ones that we hear about the most are theological issues and social issues. So people are leaving the church for theological issues like problems with the Bible itself, its contradictions, its condoning of violence, its acceptance of slavery, and big unanswered questions like how could a loving God allow his son to be murdered and how could he send people to hell, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the big theological issues. The social issues, as we know, as we hear about every day, are the dangerous political discourse and a general culture of exclusion, whether it's homophobia, racism, misogyny, et cetera, and even a culture of abuse. So a culture of exclusion, a general intolerance, and a culture of abuse. So there are huge issues that are driving people away from the church, but What's so interesting is that many former Christians will say something very similar to what you and I heard Jen Hatmaker say recently when she said something like, even as my faith was crumbling all around me, Jesus is the thing that held. And so 
for a lot of Christians, even when they exit the church, they still retain this very, very deep connection with Jesus and his message. I find that so interesting. And yet that is exactly what happened with me. I felt a connection with Jesus in my youth with the church. But interestingly, when I left, that connection came with me and it got much fuller after the church. So I got into, of course, the miracles, with the, which has a big Jesus focus. I got into other teachings, like the Edgar Casey readings that have a big Jesus focus. I got heavily into Jesus scholarship, uh, contemporary New Testament scholarship. I got seriously into the Shroud of Turin. And so what happened for me is I took him with me, and that connection has been deepening ever since. And it sounds like that story is is my own version of a story that so many people are living through. I know it sounds so ironic to say my connection with Jesus became stronger after I left the church, but that's true. Your story is mine as well. And I grew up with the best possible Jesus. I grew up with the most loving guy who I turned to even as a kid when I had a problem. And so Mm -hmm. even though I had that connection with Jesus and I loved him deeply, my connection with him has also become so much stronger because of my course study, which is something that so many students say. And it must be strange just to kind of insert myself here. It must be strange if a Christian were to hear from us because Jesus is literally the center of our lives. And yet that would seem odd, I think, for that to for someone to say that who was completely outside the church. Right. And and so many people, as we talk about all the time, so many people who discover the course, who who have had that connection with Jesus before, but who have left the church say, oh, this is the guy. This is the guy I knew before. Mm. And Mm -hmm. and here he is, but he's so much fuller and richer. And I guess we'll get into that a little bit more. But just getting back to the whole reason why people leave the church and the whole deconstruction, reconstruction movement in particular, when people leave the church, where they go is a few buckets. So there's a there's there's so all far kinds as we of, can tell. Yeah, I mean there's all kinds of different places that people can go when they leave the church. We're not saying that this is this is it. But from our observation, we've noticed that people leave the church and they either become total deconstructionists who want to burn the whole thing to the ground. And then there's the reconstructionists who I mentioned that are the people who want to rebuild the church from the inside out. And then there's this really interesting category of people that we want to talk to (laughs) called post-Christians, at least we're calling them post-Christians, who have left the church and who, like us, retain that connection to God and to Jesus and to scripture and to community and so on. These are the folks who call themselves, quote unquote, out in the wilderness. And these are the people that we are trying to reach. Yeah, I mean, the people who who just go into complete atheism, I don't think would be open to what we have to say. The people who kind or the of burn com- it to the ground, <laughs> they're not going right. to listen either. <laughs> right, and the people who who sort of come back to the fold in a new sense, they probably aren't going to be all that open either. Although you know, who knows? But the people who are still in between, they haven't really landed somewhere they might be open to this message. And to me, that that leaves open the possibility of them finding something that for me has been immeasurably richer and saner and more loving than what I left behind. Yeah, so you and I, we've really kind of gotten into this idea of, okay, how do we reach people who have left the church, but retain this connection to, to Jesus and God, et cetera. And the language that, that is being used is this idea of being in the wilderness. Do you want to say anything about that? Cause I have some things to say about that. Well, I can say some things, but, but go ahead. 
Yeah, go ahead. Well, I just know from personal experience and also from talking to so many course students, the relief that comes with being out of the wilderness. And so when I hear so many people saying, well, we have these questions about faith and and we're in the wilderness and and the wilderness is the place where you don't quite know, but asking the questions is okay. The wilderness is safe. We're here together. And I'm just watching it like, we can take you out. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we can get you out of the wilderness because here in the course is the best of everything that that Christianity offers, but turned up, the dial is turned up to uh, almost an infinite degree. And so what, what I think people are searching for in the wilderness is the unconditionally loving God, the Jesus who is the guide, the, the equality that, you know, we see each other with, with love and respect and, and that's what people are looking for. And that's what the course offers in spades as we're going to get to. And so being in the wilderness is, is painful. It's okay, but it's painful. And, and the course offers a way out. Yeah. And I think, I think it's a means to an end. I mean, in some of the things that we've taken in, it almost feels like the wilderness gets so glorified that it becomes an end in itself. It's not a way station. It's like the destination. And yet, let's face it, you know, it should be a way station. No one wants to stay out there in the wilderness wandering around forever. Right. Which, which makes us feel that the course has something unique to offer those who are in the wilderness. And I've just shared some of that from, from my perspective, but I'd love to, to hear what you have to say from yours. Yeah. Well, the course, I mean, the question of what it has to offer in my mind is so vast. I know that's the subject of the podcast, so I probably should say, and I will be saying more, but the fact is, is the course seems geared towards them, seems written towards those people who are at least, you know, somewhere either, you know, contemplating embarking into the wilderness or have been there a long time. And you see this in all kinds of ways. First of all, the course claims to be written by Jesus himself, huge claim that we could say a lot about. It talks about God on practically every page. It's probably very close to every single page. Um, talks constantly about the Holy Spirit and sin and salvation and the kingdom and heaven and God's will. The list is endless, really. It's an endless (laughs) list, yeah. Uh, The Chorus affirms a lot of the basic foundations of Christianity, and yet it also corrects and redefines things at a basic level so that there is a fundamental, to some degree, fundamental transformation of what we understand as Christianity. So it ends up offering what a lot of us see as a healed and holy view of a kind of a new Christianity. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that term myself. Um, a healed view of God and Jesus, all of it. And it seems designed to, to quench or satisfy a deep spiritual hunger to be a good person to be a source of love in the world, to, to feel close to God that so many of us were seeking in Christianity. And at least for ourselves, we didn't find there. Yeah. And I, I don't consider the course and neither do you to be the third Testament of the Bible. I know that's been kind of thrown around, but another phrase that's been thrown around is the new age Bible. And I don't Mm. think that's true either because the course got swallowed up by the new age community. But at the same time, there's so many issues in the course that are just not new age tenants. Like for example, a God that is a creator and us as sons being the created, the whole concept of Jesus, this whole language, like you just mentioned, God's plan, God's will, heaven, the kingdom, all of the stuff that that so many who are in the New Age community now have 
actually been on the run from. <laughs> and so when the course comes along and, and we're talking about God and Jesus and whatnot, it's like, wait a minute, I come on, <laughs> like, could you stop using this Christian terminology? And yet with Christians, these are familiar words. This is comfort language. This is the motherland. <laughs> and right. so it's interesting that the course has been kind of scooped up by the the, the spiritual slash new age community when its language and and its teachings are are so Christian in nature. Yeah, and I, I or, or at least they, they share so much with Christianity. I think I think it is a question of how that happened. I think what happened is that, you know, those within the Christian church, probably leaders and, and the sort of rank and file, have not been that open to the course. Okay. Meanwhile, the new age is open to just about anything. And so the course met with welcome arms there. Um, and I think also what's happened is that as people in a more new age setting got into the course, they would emphasize and connect with those elements in the course that sound kind of new agey, like we're talked about as we all, we all have divinity. We are all one with God. Uh, you know, we have a power over our experience and even over our environment. But then what also happened is those parts of the course, and you're right, they are fundamental things in the course, that do not fit with the new age, those things kind of get ignored and, and pushed to the side. And so what's happened is it has been embraced by the new age, but on a, that through a selective reading, I'd say. So we thought it would be interesting for the purposes of this discussion to go through some of the teachings in the course and talk about what the connection is with Christianity and how the course reframes the teaching. And so this is by no means an exhaustive list. We had to actually cut it down significantly just to get the few things here, but let's start with the biggies. So obviously Jesus is central to the Bible. Jesus is central to the course. So talk to us about how he appears in both of these places. Yeah, I think it's so significant that people in the church, out of the church, in non-Christian religions, people who have no, there, no religion, there is a global recognition of Jesus. There is some kind of sense in the race as a whole about him. That's not specific to to Christians. But I think there's also a lot that that especially people who are outside the church find distasteful. Like there's there's the sense that if you don't worship him, you go to hell forever. Um, he is the only begotten son of God. He's somehow categorically above all the rest of us. He's supposed to return as this awful, you know, judge at the end in the end times. So there's a, there's a mixed bag there where Jesus is, is the focus of so much love, and yet he also can seem quite frightening. And as we see the course, all of the frightening elements have been stripped out. So just like in the Gospels, he is a gentle, loving teacher and healer, and he is an authoritative teacher, and yet the other elements are not there. He's not in the course. He's not God. He's one with God, but he's not God. Um, he is also fundamentally, he was created as our equal, as our brother. He is just there. He has reached a place that we all can reach and one day will reach. And from that place, he is totally focused on our interests, our happiness, which comes through our spiritual development. And he simply lovingly guides us along the way so that we can leave our insanity and misery behind and know God again. I love the line in the course where it says something like, I'm here to demonstrate what's potential in you, meaning Jesus, because of what he achieved spiritually, demonstrated what we could do. And so, so much of how we see Jesus in Christianity and traditional Christianity is that he's just this towering figure. We will never be as holy as he is. We will never come close to being 
who he was. But in the course, he's still that towering spiritual figure. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he shows us what's possible for ourselves, grabs our hand and leads us along along the way to getting back to back home. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful vision of Jesus. Yeah, truly. And and it's interesting that part of I think why so many what we're calling post-Christians feel that connection with Jesus is because in the Bible, Jesus comes off as so much better than God. So let's talk about how God appears in the Bible and in the course. I really think that one of the course's main objectives is to elevate and and uh, sort of correct and heal our picture of God because we're all used to the biblical God who is loving. He deeply cares about his children and wants them saved and home with him. Uh, and he can be extremely wrathful. He can send you to hell if you don't do the right thing. Um, he can visit, you know, rain destruction down upon the earth. So we we're used to this God who has two sides and if you can uh, to understand the god of the course and the course is god you know we could talk for weeks about its picture of god but to understand its picture of god in the simplest way we can just imagine taking that second side of god as angry wrathful punitive we call it justice but it's a punitive justice um and just stripping away that whole second side so that all you're left with is that loving God who cares deeply about his children. And then if you imagine just taking that that first side of God and expanding it and expanding it and expanding it until it's infinite and without any opposite, it's light without an opposite, it's love without an opposite. Um, It's a beautiful vision of God and it is a theistic vision. It's a creator God. It's not just God as like, as like a sea of consciousness. It's a God who intentionally created his his son and his sons because he did not will to be alone. What's interesting is that I I think Jesus of the Bible got God. Jesus understood that God. And Jesus was trying to share the message of that God. And to some degree, it got through it got through that God is unconditionally loving from Jesus of 2000 years ago. It just didn't get through enough. And so we have this mixed bag picture of God, as you're saying, and I, I'm obsessed with the way that you describe God, because I just think that really sums it up. You take the mixed bag, the vengeful, wrathful, judgmental God and the unconditionally loving God, and you just shave off everything that is is negative and you expand to infinity, all that is positive. And that's the God that it appears in the course. And now let's talk about what it means to be created by him and what it means to have him in your life. Because Jesus of the course and Jesus of the Bible are both doing the same thing. They're pointing you to God. He is pointing you to God. It's just our picture of God has been so muddied for so long that we're a little sketch about what it is that he's pointing us to. Yeah, and I think just to be fair, on the lips of Jesus in the Gospels are two different visions of God, okay? One of them, you know, he says, you should love your enemies because that's how God is. He loves, you know, he sends his reign on the just and the unjust. He raises his son on the good and the bad. And and that comes through in the parables of Jesus. It comes through all over this vision where God cares so much about his children that he doesn't distinguish between the good ones and deserving ones and the bad ones and the evil ones. He just wants to care for them and and heal their their wounds. So there's that vision of God. But then a major theme in the Gospels, of course, is is the idea there's there's a coming apocalypse, a coming judgment of God. You know, those, those towns like Bethsaida and Chorazin, I don't know how you say those names, um, woe to them because they didn't listen to Jesus. And so on the judgment day, they are going to get it. They're going to be raised to the ground. 
So which Jesus do we accept as the real one? It's a very, very thorny, difficult, and scholarly question. And from my standpoint, if we think if we explain Jesus as the one who taught, because those two visions aren't compatible in my view, but if he's the one who taught the God who, who is going to send his judgment down on the earth, um, totally run-of-the-mill picture, right? You can find that anywhere, anytime. Where did that radical original other vision of God as unconditionally loving come from? Because that's not run-of-the-mill. That's, that's unique. Um, but if he taught the first vision that God is unconditionally loving, then it, it's, no, it's no problem to explain where the other thing came from. It just leaked into the Jesus tradition from the surrounding culture, right? Which we see happen with the Course. Well, anyway, long story, but. Well, yeah. Well, and I'm glad that you brought it up because there may have been some people listening, like maybe this girl needs to read John and then she won't see such an unconditionally loving Jesus. I, I, I think that there is some explanation that needs to take place, but it's kind of outside the scope of this podcast, but yeah, yeah. it should be said that those passages that are violent and attributed to Jesus, we believe he didn't say those things. And so and there's a there's a good scholarly case to be made for that. Yeah. So it's beyond just we don't believe he said these things. <laughs> there are scholars who <laughs> they're don't inconvenient these things too. <laughs> but um so the the what we just said about God that can actually be applied to Jesus as well, because Jesus is his own mixed bag that we've got the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount. And then we've got the Jesus of I came to bring the sword and not peace. And so if you can take the 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 wrathful, vengeful, angry Jesus with the unconditionally loving Jesus, who's pointing you to an unconditionally loving God and telling you to love your enemies, et cetera, and expand that to infinity and shave off the negative, then you've got the real guy too. And that's the guy that appears in the course. Yeah. yeah. So the next uh, category that we wanted to talk about was this idea of human nature as fallen. That's a big piece of, of Christianity. And it's also uh, a teaching in the course as well. So talk about the contrast there. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of why people are leaving the church is there is this very kind of condemning attitude towards human nature. In traditional theology, there's this beautiful idea that we were created in the image and likeness of God. We were created to be like God. Um, and yet then there's also the idea that's been present throughout so much of Christianity that, well, Adam sinned and his sin stained every subsequent human with the stain of original sin. And so now we have this fallen nature. It's not just some superficial element. Our nature is actually fallen and corrupted. Thanks and, to Eve, for which women have been paying for since the dawn of time. Yeah. Thank you very much, just Eve. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole other topic. Um, and so, you know, there is, there tends to be this condemning attitude towards human nature, our natural impulses. And that's a whole part, I think, of why people are having difficulty with Christianity. And what the Course does is it looks at all the same data, really. I mean, people do nasty, selfish things. The world is a chaotic, violent mess because of all the people being so egocentric. Um, but what the Course says is that God created us absolutely holy. He shared his nature with us when he created us. So our nature is fundamentally holy. We are his beloved son in whom he is well pleased, but that's a nature we've forgotten. Okay. We can't change it with anything we do. It will always be holy for all eternity, but we've lost touch with it. We've forgotten it. And now we identify as these basically little, you know, animals running around in clothes um, who are identified with our bodies, who are identified with some very walled off egocentric egos. We can be very attacking. And what, what Christianity has interpreted as sin, well, the Course says we've just fallen asleep to who we are. We've fallen into a dream. 
and in this dream, we seem to be sinful. Um, yet that is our identifying with an illusion of ourselves. In truth, we are still as God created us, which is one of the really beautiful concepts in the course. The workbook has us practice the line, I am as God created me, which means I never really turned myself into a sinner, even though it sure looks that way. So many people love the introduction to the course where it says nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. And that those two sentences were it's described in the introduction that the course can be summed up in this way. And it's such a, 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 a easy way to get a 2000 page book when you think that nothing real can be threatened. God created you holy, worthy, and with eternal beauty, all of it, like God created you perfect. And you just fell asleep to that, as you were saying. And that's what's real. And that can't be threatened, regardless of what you think, or regardless of what other people think of you. And what a incredibly comforting, amazing message that no matter what you do, you can't mar that perfect purity because that's how God created you. And if and we could really just God. see ourselves this way, and if we could just see each other this way, we would have the, the recipe for the healing of the world. Absolutely. Amen to that. It would absolutely transform the world. And it sounds almost like it sounds like a violation of God to say, well, we're all holy. But in the way the Course means it, it's a testament to God's goodness and power. The Course says, um, God would be mocked if any of his creations lacked holiness. So if his creations could violate the way he created them and turn themselves into something unholy, which we all seem to have done, but if that could really happen, God would be mocked. And you can see the logic in that. Like he set us up where we're holy. To, to turn ourselves into something unholy would be a mockery of him. And, and he can't be mocked, the Course says. And the Course is so full of all of these kinds of reframes. So as a former Christian, when I heard the phrase, God cannot be mocked, I was thinking, okay, well, I better not offend this guy because he's going to come after me. But in the course, the idea that God cannot be mocked is you can't change anything about the way that he created you. And if you could, as you're saying, he would be mocked. Therefore, right. God cannot be mocked. You are as he created you and you can try your best to destroy yourself, but you can't uh, because of his power and and because he's God. And if we right. had a power that was above his, he wouldn't be God. So therefore, right. what he created stands eternally. And what a beautiful teaching, because there's so much protection and safety in that. Mm -hmm. And so, as I mentioned before, we had a lot of, of like a long list that we wanted to go th through in the back and forth between what does Christianity say about this? And what does the Course say about this? The, the one that I could not leave out is equality. So can can you talk briefly about equality in the Bible and equality in the Course? Yeah, I think that there are, there are strains of equality in the Bible, but in Christianity as we know it, we kind of know how it goes. Like Jesus is fundamentally above us, and Christians are kind of, they're the saved, so in a sense, they're spiritually superior to others, especially to people of other religions, um, especially to people who are destined for hell. Um, and then there are the people that, you know, I mean, people are leaving the church because, because they feel Christianity is frowning on women, uh, minorities, LGBTQ, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the beautiful things about the Course is it says that we were all created as God's son. We were all created at the same height that Jesus has attained um, and we have forgotten. So what that means is whether we're talking about Jesus, whether we're talking about you and me, whether we're talking about Hitler, 
whether we're talking about someone who is evil or someone who is, let's say, um, you know, disabled mentally, whatever we're talking about, that is a sleeping son of God, or in Jesus's case, an awake son of God, who is every bit the equal as everyone else and every bit the equal of Jesus in their true nature. And we just have varying degrees. I mean, some people are more awake than other people. Varying degrees uh, of sleep versus uh, wakefulness on the level of appearances, but underneath that level, everyone is equal because they are equal at the very highest level. Their true nature is at the same level as Jesus. The course has so much to say about equality. The course has almost 200 references to equal equality, inequality, et cetera. And when you put them together, this beautiful picture emerges. It's, it's, everyone is equally worthy. Therefore it's our job to love everyone equally. And Mm -hmm. I, I think that's where, I mean, yes, the Bible is full of contradictions. It's kind of a mixed bag when it comes to, to this idea, but at the same time, as I was saying before, there is a real through line in Jesus's original teachings that, that we can trace, we can actually trace back to him that focus on equality. I mean, you, you and I have lamented for years about how we feel Christianity has kind of gone off the rails and, and Jesus's message didn't quite get all the way through. And yet, there was a a book recently called The Triumph of Christianity by by Bart Ehrman. And when we read that, Bart laid out a case for if it weren't for Christianity, if it weren't for Christians, um, this was in the time of Romans when Christianity developed. Romans was obviously a very dominant culture. It was Christians that came in and were preaching a gospel of loving one another. And from that, hospitals sprung up. Yeah, from especially that, caring for the poor. From exactly from that, like some proto nonprofits sprung up where the poor were being cared for, where people were living in love in tribute to the way that Jesus lived his life. And so there's always been a a equality message somewhere in Christianity modeled on Jesus's life. It just got lost. And, and I don't know how we went from a Jesus who was the ultimate peacemaker to this like symbol of toxic masculinity. So something went way off (laughs) off the rails. And I, and that's really, I think at the heart of the deconstructionist reconstructionist movement. Yeah. I mean, if we can look at people who have different lifestyles, who are, you know, different gender, different ethnicity, whatever, and, and, and think another perfect sleeping son of God. That is so different than thinking another person breaking the rules. Right. And so, as we were saying before, when people read the course and they say, that's the guy, <laughs> that's the guy that I know, then th- that's the guy that they know from the gospels, the one who was the ultimate peacemaker, the one who said, love your enemies and everyone is equal. And, and so anyway, we, that's a whole other uh, conversation that we could have, but just getting us back on track here, the, um, we went through just a small sampling of the teachings in Christianity and how they compare to the teachings of the course, but the, the benefits of the course aren't just theological. What the course also offers is an actual path that we can follow. And we wanted to tell you a little bit more about this. So, so Robert, can you talk about the course as a path? Yeah. I mean, A Course in Miracles is a course and it's meant to take you through its text, which is this longest volume, its workbook, which contains daily exercises and its manual for teachers, which is for those who will, who have graduated from text and workbook to some degree and can take what they've gained out into service to others. And one of the complaints I've seen of people leaving the church is that they wanted this, they were looking for this total renewal of the heart, 
so they could become truly Christ-like. And they felt they didn't, they didn't get that from the church. Now, imagine if you could have a detailed, lengthy course in exactly that, becoming Christ-like, actually written by Jesus with extensive wisdom that was original and radical and yet logical and practical with a year's worth of specific exercises with detailed instruction for practical application and for spiritual experience. And then once you had done that, he wants to send you out as miracle workers who contribute to the salvation of the world and who have the sense of purpose that comes from that. I mean, to have an explicit path, which is what I mean, a a course is is another way, a, a spiritual course is a way of talking about a path that Jesus himself has devised to get you to that goal of a total renewal of the heart and becoming truly Christ-like. What could be better than that? Now, imagine that there's some people who are listening who are like, well, what specifically is the path? What, what is a typical day like? And so do you want to say anything about that? I know that you and I try and keep our days on the path with varying degrees of success, but, but just describe like a typical day as a course student. Well, the idea is, is that your day is, is founded on some study of the teachings and the teachings are always geared towards wisdom for, for living um, and for how to see things differently. And then that's followed by some quiet time, which is chiefly meditation. It can also contain prayer. Uh, and then throughout the day, you have, at least in the workbook, you have an, a thought that you practice, which means you repeat it to yourself in a focused, concentrated way. And the thought is such that if you do that, it shifts the way you see the world, it shifts your mood and the way you feel. Um, And we're meant to practice that throughout the day um, in between the hour. And then on the hour, if we can, we have a couple minutes or so of additional spiritual practice centered on our thought for the day. Whenever we have upsets, we're meant to respond, we dispel those with the thought for the day or some variation thereof. And, and those thoughts can be extremely effective in dispelling upsets. So we're throughout the day, we're keeping ourselves in a state of peace and of love. And on that basis, then we are meant to be of benefit to the people around us. We're meant to be what the Course calls miracle workers. And, and to that end, we ask for guidance about what to do, about to whom to speak and what to say to them um, and where to go. And so we carry out our function in the world on the foundation of that inner practice. And then when the day's over, we have some quiet time in the evening to end the day and we, we go to sleep resting in God. It's a beautiful picture. It's obviously asking a lot, But to the extent we can do this, and we know from experience that the more we do it, the better we feel and the more we're able to be truly lovingly available to the people who who need us in our lives. It is asking a lot, but at the same time, you're getting a lot from it. So to the extent- Right, to the extent that you have that quiet time in the morning, you do have a different day because you've put yourself in a different kind of mindset to the extent that you practice on the hour or even more frequently lessons like I place the future in the hands of God, then what you find is you have less anxiety about what's coming at you over the course of every day. We're all faced with stresses. They, they, if you're really in your practice, they tend to bounce off more than they go in. And without practice and without that continual reminder, we do find ourselves more captured by the stress and the anxiety of, of what it is to live here. And then in the evening, it's very beautiful to sit and to dedicate more time to 
quiet and to reflecting on the successes that you've had during the day, what you hope to do differently the next day and, and give your sleep to, to, to God as well. And imagine just, just to break in, imagine being told exactly how to do all of those things so that they are effective. They work by Jesus. Yeah. And the whole idea of guidance too, that's something that I think may be relatively new to a, a Christian audience or maybe not. I don't know, but uh, I certainly wasn't taught to seek for guidance when I was coming up in the church, but maybe that's changed, but it's just a very, the, my point is, is that it's a very full and rich picture. And at the end of the day, what you do find is that you are a different person as a result of it. You're kinder, you're less judgmental, you're more loving. And, and that comes from the actual practice. Uh, you can get there with the teaching, uh, but you, can, you won't get far enough unless you actually dedicate your days to, to the work, as they say. Yeah, yeah. And then the course also says that you can get a long way through the teaching and the practice, but unless you go ahead and give to others the fruits of your study and practice, you won't get all the way because giving to them is how you receive more fully within yourself. And along that line, for anyone who is listening, who is new to the course, that is what a miracle is in A Course in Miracles. A miracle is an expression of love that has a healing effect on another person that in turn heals you. And so the idea of miracles isn't that there is some spectacular speed of spiritual achievement, is that they're the little acts of love um, that can be pretty spectacular that you offer throughout the day. And, and, and that's what a miracle is from a course perspective, but along the line of practice and, and having a structure to your day, this is where the course is interesting too, because it's a course in miracles, which means that it has more of a educational model than a religious one. So can you say more about that? Yeah, it's very interesting, like you said, because like here is the figure, Jesus, that is most associated with church. And yet, if this is Jesus, which obviously we can't prove, even though we believe it is, uh, he has formed this path all around an educational model. It's a course with a text and a workbook and a manual for teachers. There's no hint of the church model. In this, he doesn't say gather together, build a church, have Sunday services, you know, do these certain rituals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's nothing like that. And I think that's significant. It makes you wonder if Jesus' original model was meant to be housed in church. Because from the standpoint of the course, what's needed if we're going to be have a renewal of the heart and become Christ-like, what's needed is the mind to be trained and educated in the direction of love and away from the ego. That is an issue of the mind. And, you know, it's natural in light of that to have an educational model because that's what education is about. It's about the training and the educating of the mind. There's so much to say there, but just because we're coming on top of the hour, we should move on because we do have yeah. a bit more to cover here. Yeah. I, I mentioned in the introduction that course students are relatively quiet about being on the path of the course. And there's a reason for that. Because uh, once again, there's so much misinformation out there online and whatnot about the course that sometimes it's just far easier to to, to say nothing. And I've experienced this myself. You have people who, who genuinely care about you, but they, they think that you've been captured by the devil, that you're in a cult and whatnot. And it, it's, it's, it really is painful. And, and I, I have experienced myself, not so much the people who are outright coming at me for my belief and practice in the course, but I have seen a lot of quiet backing away 
<laughs> so mm -hmm. you have that friend who you're so used to texting and getting together with and you're like hey let's get together for lunch and and it's like yeah sure sometime and then that sometime never comes and you wonder well, what changed and you know so that's how it goes so I, we wanted to talk about this because there's there is a lot of miscommunication out there about the course and so Robert, let's just kind of get into it. Um, when when you say you are a student of A Course in Miracles and your friend or family member has not heard about it and they Google it, one of the things that comes up is, is that this is channeling and this is from demons. So, so if you're a course Because channeling is always from demons. What, what do you say to your friend or family member who thinks that you've been captured by demons. What I find strange about that, and I was never, I was, I think I got out of the church before the whole channeling thing really cranked up. So I never heard this, but I don't understand. I mean, if you put the word channeling on it and channelings from demons, okay, but the concept is there in Christianity, right? We talk about yeah, the Bible. Yeah, but it's not a positive. <laughs> well, we talk, no, no, the idea of a human being a receptor for higher information, for, for God's revelation, that's there. Oh, okay. I, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you meant being a receptor for demons. My bad. <laughs> no, no. So, I mean, you know, all scripture is God breathed. We consider the Bible divinely inspired. Um, you know, you, you've mentioned, you know, you've heard a million times, Christ laid it upon my heart. Um, I felt prompted. Uh, we, you know, in Pentecostal churches, people are receiving prophecies and such the from Jesus. The living word. All the time. So, yeah, we can use the word channeling, but we can apply the word channeling in a Christian context. Like, let's forget the word. Okay. Um, Helen Shuckman, who was the scribe of the course, and that, that's, that's the word used within the course itself or, you know, by the author of the course that she was the scribe. She heard a voice in her mind teaching her and asking her to write it down. And she did. Fundamentally, that is not any different from how people believe books of the Bible were written, from people giving forth Christian prophecy, from people feeling that Christ laid it upon their heart in their private lives. It's just a phenomenon in the church and out of the church. You know, just by taking that special label channeling and putting it on what Helen Shuckman did, which is not a label that she actually, she used. She talked about herself as the scribe. Um, it's, it's meaningless. You know, the phenomenon itself is universal. We, we have to, you know, once we see an instance of it, we have to go in and say, what exactly do we make of that specific instance? Is it something that feels healthy, wholesome, holy, or, or not? But just throwing around the term channeling and saying all channeling is demonic is, is silly. Well, I think in this case, part of why it's hard to swallow is that the author is purported to be Jesus. And Jesus is so sacred and so authoritative. And it's hard for people to believe that this could actually be from him, that he would have come back and talked to a psychologist in New York in 1965. So what, what are we to say to friends and family members who say, look, there is just no way that, that this could be Jesus? And who say this must be a demon, right? <laughs> I thought we right. covered that. But go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's kind of this is a related issue. Um, well, first of all, what we do is we take our picture of Jesus in our particular denomination, in our particular church, and we measure it against this Jesus. And if they don't come up the same, we say, well, this one can't be the real Jesus. It must be a demon. Are we that confident? in our particular churches and denominations and, and time and history, our view of Jesus that we can just compare the two and say, if you don't fit. The fact is that we know from the biblical record, Jesus aroused strong emotions and not just positive ones. 
he was a controversial figure in his life. He got rejected by his own people, the Jews. He got executed by the Romans. He was not a safe character. He upset the status quo. If he really did come back, do we honestly think that he would slide right into our status quo without a ripple? That seems ridiculous to me. We need to have an open mind and think, okay, the real Jesus was not a safe figure. Maybe he would not come back as a safe figure. And in terms of the, of the accusation of this must be a demon, we have it in the Gospels. Jesus himself was accused of having a demon and working miracles by the prince of demons, channeling demons. Okay? So he was accused back then by his opponents of having a demon. Like, what makes us think that if he came back, a lot of people wouldn't accuse him now of being demonic? Yeah, this idea of he's not a safe figure is, it's really interesting because, it, again, he he carries so much authority that if he were to come back, people would have to pay attention and, and Christians would have to pay attention because this is their guy too. And so the idea is, well, what's he going to tell us to do? And, and maybe we don't want to do that. And that's exactly what's happening because the message of the course is unconditional love and forgiveness. P.S. That was, as I've been saying, Jesus's message 2000 years ago, but nevertheless, it's the message of the course as well. And if you don't want to do that, then take the authority away and take Jesus away. So now it's not Jesus telling you to do that. It's a demon and it's very easy to dismiss. So so for that reason, you, know, you always quote the, the poem, I believe it's about Martin Luther King, where it says, now that he is safely dead, let us praise him. And the same thing is true with Jesus. Now that he's dead and we know, quote unquote dead, and we know what he has said, then let's praise him. And it's actually gotten a little worse than that because it's not only like, let's praise him, but let's overlay his teachings with all these things that we wanted him to say like how how on earth does my neighbor in north carolina have a flag of jesus with a crown and a gun like oh what the hell happened there yeah. and so so if jesus were to come back today in the, a book of wisdom we would the world would stop the world would shake stop, listen, hone in on, on what it is that he has to say. We always, sorry, I'm just kind of ranting here, but, <laughs> but we, you, you've mentioned that the archeologists will go into uh, trash heaps, like ancient trash heaps, looking for the tiniest little fraction of something that may have been of the time in which he lived. And here we have a 2000 page book that is that claims to be from him with the most beautiful brilliant knee buckling wisdom that that you would expect to come from him yeah and 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 no one's listening and so why yeah. because well he, because he's not a safe figure as you say he carries so much authority yeah when you've built up um you know massive institutions those institutions are just by human nature, they're self-preserving, they protect themselves against change. Uh, if he came back really, and we, we knew it was him, he would almost certainly not be like, yeah, you guys, you had it totally right. You're doing everything perfectly. I've got nothing to add, nothing to subtract, and I'll, I'll see you later. He would be like he is in the gospels in relation to the Jewish religion and culture, People felt very threatened on that level by him. Um, and I think going back to your, now that he is safely dead, let us praise him. I think what that speaks to is we have a tendency to take certain unsafe figures. And once they're dead, we turn them into this safe icon, right? That we can praise, we can even worship. But in the process, we've turned them into this, this facsimile that's not true to the original. 
And if the original did come back, he would be a threat to those currently praising him, right? And one last thing I want to say about all that, I mean, your, your comments brought up a lot for me, is that just because A Course in Miracles clearly claims, it doesn't make a lot of noise about it, but clearly claims to be written by Jesus, obviously that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> like the claim does not establish anything. Um, I, I read a piece of channel material once where Jesus was coming through the channel and he ranted. He said, humanity, you are quarantined. You cannot go further than 15 miles outside of your atmosphere. And it was just, it was bananas. So yeah. one, once the claim is there, I mean, I spent years with the course wondering, is this really, really Jesus? Like, that question is so serious. If we think there is good reason to really consider it, we should stand before it as long as it takes, because once we settle on one way or the other, it's a big deal. Once we say it's not him, if it is him, we've missed the boat. If we say it is him and it's not him, we've granted total authority to something like that rant. Like you cannot leave <laughs> planet earth. <laughs> I know. And, and it's, this is where people are confused because there's a lot of people out there who are claiming to be channeling Jesus. And it, well, you know, you and I think nothing comes even close to the course in that respect. Uh, anyway, what you said at the, at the end there is everything. It's, if this is Jesus, we have to stand before that question very seriously, because if if it's not him, then, um, you know, I still think the course would be amazing wisdom, but it wouldn't carry the authority that it does for me now. But if it is him, then and we've missed it, then that's that's big, too. You know. Who wants to be um, a Jesus follower who has missed him coming back? <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. And and he didn't come back with hellfire and rapture. He came back in a book. And wouldn't that, doesn't that just feel like a, a totally Jesus thing to do? Anyway, to, we're to really totally late. shatter our expectations. Yeah, we're, we're really late here, but we um, are. Let's just go through a couple more of, of um, these things that, that we can say to those who are concerned about us when we say that we're students of the course. When you research the course online, one thing that pops up near the top is that there is no sin. And yeah, in the course, there is no sin. So, so let's talk about that quickly. Yeah, uh, I think that's one of those things that's universally misunderstood by the course's critics, it seems to be taken to mean that everything we do on earth is just fine, <laughs> right? Which is a very shallow point of view. Like any teaching that would say that deserves to, to be criticized. Uh, the course's position really is that if this world were not, were, were real, we're not just a dream, and the selfish, destructive things we did to each other were real and were permanently damaging and wounding, then sin would be real, okay? From the course's standpoint, uh, we do things that appear to be sinful. The, when the course says there is no sin, what it's saying is that because this is ultimately a dream, God would not let this world be real, the things we do can't really harm other people, not on the level of their true nature, and can't really stain ourselves, making ourselves truly sinful. And therefore, they are just mistakes that call for correction, not for punishment. And so they can be forgiven, and they do not damage what we were talking about earlier, the holiness that God gave us when he created us. It's that whole very sophisticated picture and very sober picture of this world in which the Course is saying there is no sin. It's not like, hey, everything you do is great. You're fine. You're wonderful. You know, it's the Course has a dimmer view 
of normal human behavior, if you can believe it, than anything I've ever seen in Christianity. It thinks normal life is soaked with what we would call, excuse me, what we would call sin. It just sees it from a higher perspective in which it's ultimately, it ultimately can't change the perfection that God created in all of us. Yeah, and the same thing is true with evil mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Right. Of people course, criticize the same, course. Same approach to evil. Right. It's another target that people criticize in the course, like of course says that evil is not real. Right. And I remember um that uh the author of um The Road Less Traveled, M. Scott Peck, he kind of got into the course for a bit. And then by his second book, and I think it influenced The Road Less Traveled. But by his second book, The People of the Lie, he had thought, well, the course is just being naive about evil because he had attended some exorcisms and felt that he had witnessed true evil come out of the possessed people. Um, And I think that's not a, a correct, well, it isn't a correct understanding of what the course is talking about. On the level of this world, the course thinks that what we normally call evil is much more rampant and entrenched than we would ever guess. The course talks about fallen angels, okay, that we normally call demons, but it just thinks that in the really big picture, God would not let that be real. So it all takes place in a dream, a dark dream, but a dream that will one day pass away to reveal that what God creates as holy is eternal and unchangeable. And and this is where the course says, and I think you mentioned this just a minute ago, that that God didn't create the world. And that's such a foundational, fundamental Christian teaching that I imagine that's hard for for folks to accept as well. So that would be the last one. Let's end with that. Okay. And so I know just, we're way past time. Yeah. Just say something about that before we close. Yeah. I mean, to me, once you say the world's unreal, it feels like you've left Western religion altogether. And like suddenly you're you're in the East and the world is is God's play, the divine Leela. And it just feels like, whoa, where are we here? This is bizarre. But this is not a grafting on from Eastern spirituality. In the course, the world is not real because of the power and the love of our creator. The world is full of pain and separation and death and loss. That's just, you can't have this world without all of those things. They are fundamental to the world. And so there's a place where the course faces all that and says of God, it says, he is not mad, yet only madness makes a world like this. And I think as human beings, we all can relate, like who made this system up? Right. And so from the course's stand, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's just such a foundational question for Christians is how could a loving God have created such a world of suffering and what a relief it is to be able to answer that with two words. He didn't. Right. And then the next part, which is also crucial, is the course teaches that through the Holy Spirit, he is active in the world. He is a voice of love trying to call everything in the world to love, to God. Um, He's at work in every situation, in every molecule, in every atom, in every second. He is constantly helping to orchestrate things within the limits of our free will. So it's not like he's just left us in this mess, but it's our mess. And he's not, like in Christianity, he created the mess and he's also supposed to save us from it. He's kind of working on both sides. Uh, And in the course, He's just working on the, on the one side. We made this mess, but he is the one to save us from it. Yeah, there's that great line in the course. I was just looking it up on the app that says external conditions are produced by the thoughts of many, not all of whom are pure in heart as yet. And doesn't that just make so much sense of this world? Because the external conditions here are pretty bad. And, and wouldn't it make sense that within our own minds that are split between fear and love that 
we would see a world that is the very same thing that is deeply split between fear and love. And, and that quote that I just read goes on to say, why should you be at their mercy? And, and that speaks to the idea that there we are, as God created us, nothing can mar our, our true nature. And so we don't have to be at the effect of all of these external conditions that while we're in these bodies feel so very powerful over us. Yeah. I mean, so much of what's difficult about this world is what the living beings in this world do and do to each other, right? We're all running around with these petty egos. Animals are too. And we're all fighting each other. Uh, That's, that's on us. And right. so not him. It's, right. He didn't make up that system. He's the one to save us from it. Okay. Great way to end. So we'll go ahead and close it there. Robert, thank you so much for another wonderful conversation for anyone who is listening, who would like to join us live for these discussions on our podcast. You're welcome to go to circleofa.org forward slash events. You'll find the link to exploring a course in miracles. You can sign up there. It's free and receive the access information for these discussions, which we have every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And we hope that you will share this conversation with anyone who is in your life, who is curious about the course or who even may be concerned uh, for you, if you are a course student, it happens. So we hope that uh, that you've enjoyed this discussion. We hope this kickstarts a conversation here at the circle, and and as we were saying, with with Christian thinkers and writers and influencers, we are really really excited about the opportunity to dialogue on these topics even more. So with that, we will leave you. Thank you so much for listening, and bye for now. <music>